good to be here. I can't tell you how excited I am to be here in light of what's happening. You know, I was here about a couple months ago, and we talked about uh, the moment of a Susan now. Raise your hand. This, is, this, before, this has nothing to do with the message. This is a preamble to the message. Raise your hand if you saw anything about a Susan now in California. You know, it's amazing what's still happening out of a Susan now. It wasn't a, just a one-time event. It was an event that is now spurring on a whole movement in America. I was just with Lou the other day. He was in my garage, and we were praying, and Andy was there, and we, he was saying it's time to do seven more stadiums in America. And I want to go back in time to what I said before. I was with him in December before Susan Al is coming in April, and he was so discouraged that Christmas. He's like, Brian, he goes, the warfare over this, I don't know if anyone's going to come. I just don't know. And he goes, man, I know we're doing it. And I think we'd only have like seven to 8,000 signed up. He comes to Singapore and he tells me, he goes, I'm going to Singapore. I go, I'm going to be there at the same time. He comes to Singapore and that's where the moment hits of the catalytic role of Singapore in the American revival. Because what happens is Singapore sees the need not just, not just in a little bit, but they kick it open, the door, with this million-dollar-plus gift. And when I saw Lou come back, I said, Lou, how was it? Did you? He was a different man. And to be around Lou Engle is a guy that's always rocking. He's always got the latest fiery message. And he was undone and melted and like a different human being. He was marching around with joy. And it was at that moment that two to 3,000 people started signing up every single day from the moment in Singapore. From the moment in Singapore. I'm, I'm, I'm saying this for a reason. Is I know you're not there in California to see it. Some of us were. But now what's happening is, see, in that stadium was the first time we'd seen in a long time physical healing break out in a stadium what it was, wasn't ministering to by the people on the stage. In other words, People were praying for people in the stadium, and they were getting healed by people. And then they would raise up the wheelchair, and you'd look out, and you'd see like 100 or 200 people cheering while the main thing was going on. And it was like a Reinhard Bonnke crusade had come to America at different points, and it was breaking out. And people were getting blind eyes open, deaf ears, cancers. And the healing didn't stop at the stadium end. It continuing on now. And in fact, on the East Coast, there's a healing outbreak of a young girl that was healed of cancer, just totally turning a high school upside down. There's something that kicked open through Singapore's investment in America and the catalytic role of this of church. And I want you to receive it. It's important to receive something when you've been part of something. And I know what that's like. Sometimes people pay me a compliment and they're like, oh, yes, you're right, it's good. But there's an impartation that I want you to receive as being catalysts that catalyzed a nation. Because in that nation, when we would talk about renting stadiums the last five years, everyone would say, that isn't done anymore. No more in America. The days of Billy Graham are over. And it wasn't until Lou sold his house, which was the start, and Singapore said yes, that all of a sudden stadiums in America are no longer a fiction or a fantasy, but they're a reality. And so there was a catalyst and a catalyst. Lou Engle and the call comes together with Cornerstone, and there's an explosion that occurs, and it's still happening. And you know what it's like when you're around faith? When you're around someone with great faith, you're a different person. When you're around someone with medium faith, you feel it, you're ordinary. But when you're around someone with great faith, when you're with Lauren Cunningham, Youth with a Mission, he talks about every nation, every idea I give him, it's too small. He says, Brian, no, it's more nations, it's more this, it's more this. And you're like, man, I so believe it. You're so stunned. You're so like, I want to be that. Have you had that experience? That's what Lou felt when he came here. And that's what ricochets into America. And so for Andy and I, we saw with our eyes the catalytic role of Singapore firsthand. 
We didn't read about it in a prophecy. We didn't read about it because someone said Singapore is cool. We didn't hear about it in a book on Singapore. We didn't have pastors tell us from Singapore. With our own eyes, we saw the catalytic role of a nation changing another nation. And 1 John says the disciples saw Jesus. The disciples, they, they said we, what we've seen, what we've heard, what we testified to. In other words, they weren't writing books about something that happened 500 years ago. They're like, we were there, we saw Jesus, we're writing about it. Well, we were there and we saw one of the largest stadiums created in America. There was no way to fill it with more than 5,000. A nation that is in a desperate place right now. And all of a sudden, a kickstart of faith. And somebody and everyone now is saying, you know what, that was the greatest idea in the world. Have you ever had a bad idea until God says it's his idea and it actually works and everyone that was a naysayer says it was a great idea afterward? Well, there's a parade of great ideas. Would you just close your eyes for a second? I just pray, God, this place would receive the blessing, God, of what occurred in America would be raining down on them, Lord, and the blessing of their investment, the blessing of what they catalyzed would ricochet back into Singapore and explode in the nations. And it wouldn't just be America now, it would be many nations that Singapore is catalyzing all over the world. I pray now is the time for Singapore to catalyze a move of God in more than one nation, in many, many nations. And we say it is now in Jesus' name. So searching for the scripture is Father's Day. I, I didn't realize it was Father's Day by truth. Truth and fear of God. I didn't realize it was Father's Day. You know how it is when you travel. You don't for, remember sometimes the holidays. And so I've been preparing for this for like eight weeks, praying and praying and praying. God, what are you saying to Singapore? What is the word? What is the word? Genesis 12. It's the father of faith. It's Abraham. And so I know that it's, it's, it's the Father's Day weekend, but that's just a lucky break. This, is a, this was a collision God had planned that I didn't understand. When we look at Gen Genesis 12:1, the Lord said to Abraham, go from your country, go from your country and your kindred and your father's house to the land I will show you and I will make of you a great nation and I will bless you and make your name great so that you will be a blessing I will bless those who bless you and him who dishonors you I will curse and in you all the families of the earth shall be blessed so Abraham went as the Lord had told him and Lot went with him Abraham was 75 years old when he departed from Haran and he took his wife Sarah and Lot his brother's son and all their possessions they had gathered and they had acquired, and they set out to go to the land of Canaan. I want to just start here just for a second and just get this in our minds. We see that over and over in the Old Testament, before Genesis 12, we see that God was trying to, trying to do something. We see it in the basic terms. We have Adam, who doesn't choose right, and that there's all of a sudden there's this, there's this seed of enmity between God and man that only Jesus is going to be able to resolve later. But there's this wrestling that begins now in the human race. We see it with Noah. We see the whole world at capsized. There's a flood now. There's a disaster now. And God's rescuing Noah and Noah's house. We see this tension between man and God before Genesis 12. We see the Tower of Babel. We see man saying, I'm going to raise up. I'm going to show you what I can do. And instead of elevating God, we see man trying to elevate themselves. And so God is thinking to himself, I have a plan to redeem this whole world, and it's going to start with a father. It's interesting that God had to pick a man that would pick this assignment of having so much faith that he could believe to leave something and step into something that would lead to the blessing of every nation. And when I thought about Singapore and I prayed about Singapore, and I, this might be just a, a little bit of a heavy thing to say to someone, heavy in a good way. I feel that Singapore has that father's mantle that Abraham had, a father to a modern day missions movement across the earth. And we've crashed into it here this weekend. Here it is. Look at this again in the text. Abraham is the one that God picks for a new way of life, 
for a people for himself and for the redemption of the world. It was going to come down through Abraham. He picks this one man. And you know, it's interesting when you think about this man being a father, known as a father of faith. I've met a lot of men that are great fathers. But when you meet a father and he's associated with the word faith, you got to give him props. you got to think about it for a minute. Wait a minute. Abraham, what was it about you that was so unique and so different that God could choose you to be a father to all of us? And it wasn't that he was a father of love, although he was loving. It wasn't that he was a father of gentleness. It wasn't that he was a father of all these attributes. The core attribute of Abraham was that he had faith. And this was the turning point in history. Men had put themselves against God, and God now picks his seed, and that seed is Abraham, and he's going to bless the world. And I think when I was talking about a Susan now, and I was talking about America, I was saying to you, you know what? Everyone says now that the worst days are before us in America. And Singapore said, no, you know what? We see things differently than that. We see the greatest possibilities are before us, not the worst conditions are before us. And that's what Abraham was like. He had this ability to say, there's a possibility here. I'm leaving everything I have. But because of God, there's a greater possibility than the negative of what I'm leaving behind. And that's what happened when that stadium broke out, is there was all of a sudden a seed of possibility of what God could do. And there was a fathering in this nation of that faith. We're aware of the conditions of the world, but we should have serious signs on our heart. But what are the possibilities? What are the possibilities? And that's where Andy and I begin to dream. Is it time for another modern-day missions movement like the ones in the past? Is it time for another modern-day missions movement? It'll look a little different than before, but is the hour come for volunteerism across the earth? And is it time for Singapore to say, you know what, we are of the condition of a father's heart. And we can see that. And we're going to be dads to it. We're going to kick it open. In the days of Abraham, you know, the, the world was just as messed up. The city he was in was just as messed up had just as much junk going on, and he left it. He left it, and he left it, and he just left it cold, and he took off because he was looking for something different. I want to talk just briefly, just briefly about the disturbance of God's call. I've always, I've always been a God's call guy. I love the call of God. I like teaching on it till I got older. Younger, I liked the call of God because it was like, I got picked, I get an assignment, that's the best. Until God starts giving you a calling that disturbs you because of the faith needed to do it. Do you know what it's like to have the call of God almost like haunt you and follow you? His his word over your life, and you're trying to run from it, you're trying to understand it. And that's what happened to Abraham. Can you imagine his mind when God said, I'm going to bless you. And later in Genesis, I'm going to bless you like the stars of the sky. Can you imagine him laying in his bed going, I don't even have a kid. I don't even have a son. How disturbed was he with how big God said he was going to bless him? And he wrestled through it, but he never said no. He stayed in the game, and his yes made the way for every other yes. Look at Abraham's life. God's calling comes. So when you become conscious of that call, sometimes it can disturb you. And it, and it was in his heart. It's like it starts as a gentle awareness, and we're kind of wrestling through it. And then all of a sudden, the call becomes greater and greater and greater. And he had to build, and he had to leave that thing that he built and take off and do something new. I was in the Pacific Northwest of America, Tacoma, Washington, Seattle area. And we were there ministering, Christy and I, for 10 years. And we saw in our city almost every high school with two to three hundred kids coming to Christ. We had almost every middle school, junior high. We had one school that had 600 kids and 400 of them were in our Bible club. We had a college campus with 1,300 students on campus, maybe 1,400, and 800 of them would come to our gatherings. My wife had a Bible study for nine years that had 120 women packing out our house, all leaders, There was healing. There were miracles. People would come from all over the world to be delivered. Lauren and Darlene Cunningham came from YWAM. 
They said this is the closest thing to Youth with a Mission when it started. I mean, it was all over the city, freedom in Christ. People were getting so free. People would fly in from all these ministries. Things were going great until I got an invitation in the mail from Reinhard Bonnke to go to a 50-person evangelist gathering in Orlando, Florida. And I, I, I got this invitation. It said you had to fill this stuff out. I filled it out. I got Lauren Cunningham to send me a letter so that Reinhard would believe that I could come. And Lauren wrote a good thing. I think he only wrote, I, I don't know if Brian will turn into a great evangelist, Reinhard, but this I do know is he's got a great heart. And so I got in the class. And everyone in the class was a great, you know, one of those evangelists that everywhere they go, somebody's getting healed, they touch someone, they're knocked out. Everybody was like first class Holy Spirit. I was third class Holy Spirit in there, kind of hiding in the front row, hoping that Nothing too crazy would happen to me. And really just looking at the pictures on the wall and all the books of Reinhardt and wanting some films that he'd made and ready to leave. Do you understand what I'm saying? I was already doing so well, I thought, in the Northwest. This is just going to be a nice little add-on. And so I'm standing in the front row. He speaks. I'm blown away. And I begin to hang out there because I wanted him to kind of lay hands on me. It was the break time. He comes over to me. Everyone else, he was saying nice things too. I looked. I go, well, this is going to be wonderful. This guy was saying, oh, it's so good to see you, Ralph. It's been years, and you're amazing, and Bill, you're amazing, and everybody was amazing, and everyone was, like, loved. So I'm in a setup of, like, this is going to be so great. Big hug, picture, the whole deal. He looks at me. He doesn't smile anymore. He goes, prophetic. He goes, you, sir, when was the last time you did something preposterous? I was just like this. And he goes, do you have a salary from a church? I go, yeah, I'm the head pastor. He goes, yeah, get rid of your salary. It's for the nations. You got to go. I mean, man, it was disturbing. How was, I think my mind went, how am I going to go home and tell everyone I have to leave? How am I going to sell my house? What am I going to do? And I went to the snack area. Do you got anyone here in Singapore comforted by food? I know you are. So I went to the donut area and had a maple bar and tried to hide out. And Reinhardt sent his assistant back there, Peter, and Peter found me and was eating a maple bar until he saw me. And he looked at me, and I don't know if they planned this in the back room. I don't know if they were just cheating off each other's prophetic notes, but he looked at me and he said, you, sir, when was the last time you did something preposterous? Do you have a salary? That's the problem. Get rid of your salary. It's for the nation's. And I went out to the parking lot and I wept and I realized that I'd become comfortable and safe and it was time for me to go. I want to ask you this question. Isn't it amazing when God call comes to you, it's disturbing. And Abraham was in this place of disturbance and God was meeting him and saying, Abraham, I need you to step into something that's so great and I need a guy to say yes and I'm picking you. You got to say yes. You got to leave everything you got to live in a tent. We left Tacoma. I remember selling my house. It was in, it was in the crash, and our house went down $400,000, and so we lost everything. All our belongings we sold. You know the nice kitchen table, the one you bought for $3,000, and you sell it on whatever, on, on Craigslist or whatever you have here for $200 because no one buys it for full price. Everyone bought everything in our house in two or three days. We had enough for the plane tickets and a little bit for, uh, you know, maybe, I don't know, just just a few extra clothes, and we left with all of our inheritance gone, lost in the house, lost in the furniture, arrived in Kona, Hawaii, sitting next to Lauren Cunningham going, okay, I came. How you doing? Like, I was waiting, like, okay, give me my calling. The man of God's here. Me, you know, right? He goes, I'm just so glad you're here. I'm not hearing anything right now about anything. Just invest in the Lord. You know how you answer that. Yes, great. I'm going to invest in the Lord. Absolutely. And you just leave so sad. And then everyone around you tells you to get time alone with the Lord. And I, everybody knew me in the Northwest. People were coming to see me. Now I'm by myself on a little desert island living on a rock over on the sand. The only thing I had in my life was the same barnacle I saw every day on the same rock. 
I'd read these books. I read revival books. I read every book on the Holy Spirit filling. I read every revival book 10 times I already read, waiting for the filling. Nothing happens. And I'm walking into Ohana Court after about six months of this, and Andy Bird and I became friends in this moment. And the friendship with Andy Bird and Fire and Fragrance in Kona begins to erupt in my heart. And he invites me in, and I begin to teach in his class. And all of a sudden, the power of God drops in the class. I threw the book I wrote on the ground and said, I'm sick of teaching my material. I need God. And God came down, the power of God, and the meeting went on for nine hours all throughout the day, the whole campus looking in the window. And we said, something's going on. Something's happening. And it was a seed of faith. And then our friend Amy came in and said, it's time for the circuit riders. I saw an angel. And the angelic encounter said, it's time for the circuit riders. We released in America and the nations again. And the circuit riders were these raw revivalists in American history. They were these fierce men on horses that brought revival all across America. And instantly I knew, God, you're calling me to be a father. I left everything, being a speaker, being an author, being everything. I'm no longer able to build my thing. I'm a father. And he said, move to America. And we moved to Huntington Beach. We moved 17 times in three months. My wife's been sick 36 years, pretty much bedridden. We lived in hotels. We lived in, in basements. We lived in garages. And that's where all the music you heard today, that band came out of the garages. And we started to march across America in college campuses began to explode. And all of a sudden, evangelism started to break out. And universities started, kids started coming to Christ. And all starts building around the USC campus. And then Lou and I'd go on this 40-day fast. He crashes into Singapore. Singapore kicks him over the finish line. And an explosion happens in LA. And now it's going across America. And I go back to that Reinhard Bonnke Orlando moment when he said, you, sir, when was the last time you did something preposterous? And I go, oh my gosh, it's coming into being. I'm so glad I left. And I feel that for, for that fathering heart that you guys have demonstrated in this house. It's that faith of Abraham. And I'm going to invite Andy to, to, to react to this in a, in a second. But here's what I think his key is when God's getting ready to do something big, in his heart, he finds a father. It's his way. He doesn't look for a speaker. He doesn't look for, you know, you can, it, it's just this heart condition. And we see man oftentimes always wants to build something to make himself great. And then we see it opposed to the father, who the father's like, no, I just want to make God great. And so God was looking, and he's looking on the earth, and that's why I feel like Singapore is linked to this Abraham heart. Because this Abraham heart in Singapore is, no, we're not going to make ourselves look great. We're going to make you look great, God. That's what our heart is, because I saw you guys do it in California, and it just exploded. And there's this heart that's the heart of a father over this nation. And so I wonder what God's about ready to ask you. What is God about ready to ask you? And so as I, as I bring this down, you know, it's amazing how Abraham lived in a tent. He lived, he had all this wealth, and he lived in this humble way, and he made something happen that we're all so blessed by. Can I call out all the dads in the room? Dads, it's our time. Fathers, it's our time. Every father this weekend is a Father's Day that we will mark as the day that God walked up to us and said, you, sir, have done the preposterous. Something has hit in California and into the nation. You are about ready to do something even more preposterous because your heart beats like mine. And I'm going to give you something that's going to bless the nations. And there's coming a missions movement. And as I was praying with Christy, and my wife is an incredible prayer woman, I came here seven years ago because I had a vision of a man that was sick and I was to go and pray for him. And Lauren Cunningham called me four hours later, said, my, one of my good friends is in Singapore and he's sick unto death. Will you fly there and pray for him? And so I went and flew here knowing no one. And I drove up to his house wearing a nice suit that I bought, trying to look good. You know how you do. And uh, he opened the door wearing shorts and a tank top. And I realized that Singapore is way too cool for my suit. <laughs> And I looked like a fool, but he was loving and hugged me and said, come on in, uh, take off your tie. 
and uh, it was brand new from the suit warehouse in LA. And uh, I used all my last money to buy it, and it was never wore it again. But the, maybe one time, but I don't remember now. I don't think I ever did. It's still in the closet. But it's a nice suit with dust on it. But I walked in there, and I've been praying for Singapore for seven years. I come twice a year, and I pray one week. And I pray for my friend to be healed. And I lay on the floor in his house, and I pray, God, this is the place, Singapore. You have chosen it. And I pray like, and then you guys bought that Reese Howell's campus. And Reese Howell's book, Intercessor, is the two books that influenced me more in my life was Intercessor would be number one, and then Dietrich Bonhoeffer's Cost of Discipleship, those two. And, D, and this one, man, when I saw that you guys had bought the College of Wales, I said, this is too much. I've given up everything on some of the principles in Intercessor. This is too much. And I've been in Singapore for seven years, hidden as an intercessor, and this is the first weekend, and God told me, he said, wait till the musicians arrive. You won't say anything in Singapore until the musicians come. And I would never have known that Lindy and the team was going to be number one. Literally, they're number one on iTunes in America this week. Lindy and the Circuit Riders are number one on iTunes, number one on Billboard, number one on Christian Billboard. All this erupts with the timing of this visit and this moment. So I want to prophesy to you this as I give Andy, get ready to come. Number one, there's a bumper crop coming for Singapore. And a bumper crop means this. It's an unusually productive harvest. And I saw all of Singapore was covered with crops of ripening fruits in various crops. And you started to ex export, export more and more. And the more that you exported, the bigger the fruit became. Genesis, or Deuteronomy 28.8, the Lord will send a blessing on your barns and on everything you put your hand to. The Lord your God will bless you in the land he has given you. So number one, get ready for an unusually productive harvest. Number two, fathers, this is a man, Singapore has a mantle of training and instruction, and I'm going to tell you why, and you're going to understand this so deeply. The Bible says, fathers, do not exasperate your children. There's much too much training on the earth that exasperates young people. And Singapore has a father's heart, and there's a mantle of training and instruction coming on this nation to train young people all over Asia in the ways and purposes of God. And so Singapore, get ready for this to be a major hub of training and instruction all over the nations. Number three, we saw you as princes. Christy and I saw this nation as a prince, dressed in royalty, dressed in beauty, but yet you were always washing the feet of others. And so, Singapore, you are called as a servant, a servant to the nations, a servant as you are royalty, but yet you choose to serve. The father of faith is the mantle of Singapore on behalf of young people all across America that didn't remember or know there was a God who healed. Thank you. And on behalf of what's about to happen now with the missions mobilization across the world. Thank you. I love working with my friend Andy Bird. Let's invite Andy Bird up. It is such an honor to be with you, and I'm not going to be long here, um, but I've had the privilege of spending the last several days with uh, a crew called the uh, Burning Hearts and uh, at a conference they were holding. And so stunned by the Singaporean people. And this may be my third trip here, and, but it's also the first time in my trips here that I've ever been able uh, to be able to actually speak and just share some of what I felt the Lord has said for this nation. And so flying in, same as Brian, we spent the last several weeks really seeking God and what he's wanting to say, what he's wanting to say to Singapore. And we know you've heard and have done amazing things and we've just come as a Barnabas to just encourage and bring encouragement to what you've already done and to what the next season is. And I was thinking how profound it is that it's Father's Day and I, I have five children. So I love Father's Day, it's amazing. But there's two aspects to Father's Day that really I think are, are, are real. And one is it's incredible because your kids, you know, are like, we love you, Dad, all those great things in the video that all the dads said, you know. But the other part about Father's Day that I don't know if other fathers can relate to is like Father's Day is also where I'm reminded I'm a father of five kids. And it's like, holy smokes. And it's so in one moment, I'm like, yeah, they love me. I'm a great dad. And the next moment, it's like, oh, my Lord, I have five kids I'm responsible for. And it's like this amazing elation and joy and excitement. And at the same time, there's like this fear of the Lord. 
this sense of responsibility, right? These little ten little eyes are looking at me every day, for better or worse. And they're going to repeat, they're going to mimic what I show them, what I teach them, right? And so there's the celebration. I feel part of what Brian's emoting is like, please hear from us coming from America. We want to honor you because you helped start something that is literally changing lives right now. Like, it's real, real names, real faces. I was at a gathering with Lou just a couple weeks ago, and these young people from West Virginia came and said, Lou, the day after Azusa Now, a young girl stood up that Brian referred to in the hallway of her public high school and said, I was healed of terminal cancer. And she started preaching the gospel in a public high school that turned into a move of God where hundreds of kids were saved. I was standing with three of them, 16, 17 years old. They'd been saved like two weeks. They had so much passion for Jesus, so much zeal in their hearts. And they were newly saved. That was part of the fruit of Singapore. I, we, Lou told us about another group of Native Americans that came. A man had done a 40-day water fast leading up to Azusa. And his community, it was so enamored by this, they weren't even believers. But they were stunned by anyone who would fast on just water for 40 days. That they were tracking with him, trying to find out what he was doing. They heard he was going to Azusa now, and I think it was 40 or 50 of them came with him, not even Christians. And at Azusa now, they got radically saved, marched down to the beach, got baptized in the ocean, went home to their native reservation, and a move of God has broken out in that reservation. Hundreds of salvations. And I hope what you're hearing from Brian and hearing from myself is that we ought to honor you as a father to a move of God that is breaking out in America. We know it's the beginning. There's so much more to come. But we believe with all of our hearts that what began at Azusa cannot be stopped. And then at the same moment, it's like we're coming and going, honor you fathers, but going, America is only one nation that you're called to touch. And that you're to be a father to many nations. And that Singapore has an inheritance all over the earth. And that is a privilege, an honor, the same honor I feel when I look out at my five children and go, this is the greatest honor I'll ever have in life is to raise these five kids. And that God has postured you, Singapore, with the honor and the privilege of marking the earth. When you look back on history, you see that England was the catalyst to the first great missions movement. It was Hudson Taylor and William Carey and other heroes, right? And, and the missions movement began, the modern missions movement, and nations were touched all over the earth, and it led to another move of God in a nation called America that became the catalyst to the second missions movement on the earth. And hundreds of thousands went from America and they went from the shores and began to go inland and all over to nations and tribes and unreached peoples. And really America was the catalyst to that. And here's what I feel the Lord saying. We prayed this, you know, coming in for this trip is could it be that God's raising up Singapore to be the third catalyst to maybe one of the greatest missions movement the earth has ever seen? Because the catalyst often isn't a massive Thing. It's usually a small element added to a mixture that brings a combustion or a change or changes the chemical property. Could it be that Singapore is a relatively small nation that God wants to use to catalyze a missions movement to reach the least reached places on the earth? Could it be that the Himalayas are your inheritance? Could it be that the Middle East is your inheritance? I believe when you bought the Reese Howes Bible College, you bought an inheritance in Europe. And I believe Singapore is a catalyst to an awakening all across Europe. And we're coming in one sense honoring you. It's Father's Day. We want to honor you for the, that you have children. And America is one of them that you're blessing right now. And then the same moment to come and say, but do you realize you have many children? And it's only the beginning. And God has blessed Singapore for a reason. Abraham, and it's interesting, I'm almost done here, that in, in uh, uh, Genesis chapter 11 is the Tower of Babel where man built their own tower, their own future. They built with self-focus, and they built for their own reputation. They built for their own comfort, their own good. And then all of a sudden, in Hebrews chapter, or in Genesis chapter 12, now you have a man who leaves it all behind to follow a voice of someone he cannot see, to obey a God, to build a kingdom that he would not see with his own eyes, but an eternal kingdom. 
And we believe with all of our hearts that God is beckoning Singapore and saying, will you set your mind in heavenly places? Will you build for eternal purposes? When so many on the earth want to build for towers of Babel, Singapore, will you build for eternity? Will you build for eternity? Can we erase unreached from our vocabulary in this generation? There are 7,000 people groups on the earth that have not heard the name of Jesus. There are 3 billion people on the planet right now that have never heard the name of Jesus. They call them unreached. Could we change that in this generation? Could Singapore be a catalyst to change that in this generation? To build an eternal kingdom. To build for eternal purposes. To be willing to joyfully sacrifice anything it would cost for eternal purposes. We believe, and I know you do too, that God has raised up Singapore for this hour, for this purpose. And I want to ask maybe the band would jump back up if you would. And, and uh, we just want to pray a few things together and, and let the Lord really, you know, mark individuals as well. Because this is not only a word for a nation who believe, and it's a corporate word, but it's also a word for many individuals in here that are having a beckoning like Abraham. And here's what I want to say, too, as we jump into this moment, is isn't it interesting that faith is so much based on trust? And if you think about, you know, we just spent uh, 45 minutes worshiping a God we could not see, and none of us questioned it. And every one of us in here would call ourselves Christians and would say we had a salvation moment with a voice we cannot actually audibly hear. And if we follow a God, we cannot see with our own eyes. But nobody in here, we're not questioning that. Right? Our salvation was real. If I asked you, are you saved? Everyone here would go, of course I'm saved. If I kind of overly question it, you'd punch me. Like, I know I'm saved. But do you realize that your salvation was with a God you couldn't see and a voice you couldn't hear? But what's interesting is that's just the beginning of the journey. If we could believe God for our salvation, why couldn't we believe Him for every impossible promise that He's given us? Why couldn't we believe Him for every impossible nation on the earth? Why couldn't we believe Him for every closed country on the planet? Why couldn't we believe Him for every hard heart in Singapore? Why couldn't we believe that though 20 or 25% of the nation is saved, why couldn't we believe for a million more salvations in Singapore? Why couldn't we believe for a move of God and a harvest all across the earth like no one has seen? Because we came into our salvation believing in a God we couldn't see and a voice we couldn't hear audibly. We worship a God we can't see in a voice we can't hear. And if we will believe in that much to worship and to, ba- to, to believe that our entire eternity is based on that God, how much more can we believe Him for every impossible situation? That was Abraham. Believing God for every impossible situation. There are no impossibilities. You say go, I go. You say give, I give. You say tense, it's tense for me. You say a land I've never been to. Abraham was more consumed with the God that he was following than the place he was going. He was more consumed with the God that he was following than the place that he was going. Singapore, God has consumed your heart. You are a people of devotion. You're a people of deep love. None of us know where it's exactly all going 20 years from now, but could we today, on the eve of Father's Day, tonight, could we sign up with a fresh sense of trust, with a fresh invitation to faith, and with a fresh joy of sacrifice for eternal purposes, The same thing that was in the heart of your church that said, Reese House Bible College, we want it. The same thing that was said, America needs a move of God. Azusa, we're in. That faith. And we're coming saying as as friends, like family moment tonight, we're coming and saying, can we together tonight believe that this is just the beginning? This is just the beginning. What if Singapore is a key to the Syrian refugee crisis? Come on. What if Singapore is a key to a breakthrough in North Korea? What if Singapore is key to a move of God in France and England and Germany? Can we sign up tonight? And are we willing to sign up tonight with the joy and the responsibility of fatherhood? So if you're willing to, I just want to invite you to stand. Because it really, that was where it began for Abraham. God just said, go. And you know, go began with the first step. You've already taken like 400 steps. 
But what's wild is that when we take 400 steps and we're like, that was wild, all these things we've done, God's like, I'm so glad you've taken 400 steps. There's a whole bunch that have taken no steps. But then he says to the guy that took 400 steps, he says, but can you take 4,000 steps? Because I want to add to your more with even more, with even more, with even more, with even more. So Singapore, God's asking, will you be a catalytic spark to another harvest in Singapore? Will you? What's your answer tonight? Will you? Will you go to the least and the last and the lost in Singapore? Could you believe for the high schools and the universities of Singapore? What would you say to the Father if he beamed in right now and that was his voice and he said, Church, Cornerstone, would you believe and will you be a catalytic spark to a massive har harvest in Singapore? What would you say? What would you say? And the Father said, I'm so proud of you. Thank you. I love you. But Singapore, Cornerstone, will you be a catalytic spark to a harvest in nations all over the earth? Europe, other parts of Asia, the Middle East, what would you say? What would you say, church? Back of the church, what would you say? What would you say? Holy Spirit, we pray right now that you would come and that you would fill our hearts with fresh faith on Father's Day for a move of God across the earth that unreached could no longer be said in this generation because of Singapore and the catalytic role it would play. We pray right now, fill us with that faith. Fill us with that faith, Jesus. If you would, if you would, begin to lift your voices with me right now. Let's ask God. Let's ask God, fill us with faith. And in the same breath, let's say, God, we say yes. Fill us with faith and we say yes. Let's lift our voices all over this place. God, fill us with faith and we say yes. You've just listened to a production of Cornerstone Community Church. Please note that all unauthorized reproduction, distribution, or sale of the recording is prohibited. For permission to reproduce or distribute the sermon, please write into mail at cscc.org.sg. We hope that you have been blessed.